Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations, and it's a great honor to have today Justice Samuel Alito. Thank you for joining us, Justice it's Alito. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Good to have you. So, uh, how, how did you learn you were going to become a Supreme Court Justice? That must be a striking moment in one's life. Yeah, it was. Um, I remember it exactly. I was sitting at my kitchen table at home in New Jersey, uh, drinking a cup of coffee, and now you're a judge at this point on the I appellate. I was a judge on the of, Third Circuit. You know, right. I had been there for, for 15 years. And uh, the phone rang, and it was uh, uh, a deputy uh, counsel in, White, in the White House Counsel's Office, Bill Kelly, who called me to say that the president was uh, seriously thinking about nominating me. Well, first he told me that Harriet Myers, who had been nominated for the seat, was going to withdraw, and that, that was not public information at the time, and then he said the president was seriously thinking about nominating me. Was I still interested? And I said, yes, I was still interested. So that was really the, that wasn't the formal, uh, the formal offer. And then uh, Andy Card, who was the chief of staff at the time, called my house when I was at the office. My daughter answered the phone, and so she took a message. Andy Card from the White House called took a little while for her to realize what this might be about. Then she consulted with my son, and together they figured out that, that what it was probably about. So I spoke with him, and then I think maybe the next day, this happened over the course of probably three days, uh, uh, Andy Card had arranged for a time for, for the president to call me. So the president called, and he said, I would like to nominate you for a seat on the Supreme <coughs> Court, and I said, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd be very honored, and there was a pause, and he said, well, do you accept? He wanted to, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> he wanted to seal the contract, so I said, yes, of course, I accept. And you had met the President before that? I had, yes. He interviewed, uh, he interviewed me in July. For the, early, for the opening? Yeah, the sequence was yeah, that um, it was a complicated I, year for the for it Supreme was, Court. It was comings yeah, the, and it goings. Was complicated. Um, I had actually been interviewed the first time in 2001. I think that the the Bush administration, probably like um, all administrations these days, began began to put together a list of potential nominees long before there was a vacancy because the the modern process of vetting nominees has become fairly elaborate. So that. I was interviewed in 2001 uh, by, um, uh, by White House counsel, and then in the spring of 2005, before <coughs> the end of the Supreme Court's term, I guess the, the White House began to think that there was a possibility that there would be a vacancy at the end of the term. So then I was interviewed um, by the Vice President and a number of other people. And then at the end of the term, Justice O'Connor announced that she was going to retire. Uh, and it was after that that the president interviewed me. Uh, but at that point, he nominated John Roberts for Justice O'Connor's seat. And then when Chief Justice Rehnquist died later that summer, uh, he nominated John Roberts for the Chief Justice seat and nominated Harriet Myers for the associate justice uh, seat, but then, as I said, she she withdrew. And what are these interviews like, to the degree you can discuss them? I mean, what, it must be kind of strange. You're a sitting appellate court judge, been there quite a while, suddenly you're there for you know, like interviews, sort of like back yeah. to back to college <laughs> or something. You know? Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it it is it is unusual. Well, the the uh, the protocol is that those who are doing the interviews can never ask the nominee. Uh, how the nominee would vote on any particular case or any particular issue. But they uh, ask a lot of probing questions about uh, the, the potential nominee's general approach to interpreting the Constitution, interpreting the law, the role of the courts. Uh, they may ask about, uh, in the case of a, of a sitting judge, decisions that the, the judge uh, has made in the past. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty extensive. The interview with the President was uh, particularly unusual for me, having been kind of a cloister <coughs> appellate judge for 15 years. Um, I was asked to come down to, to Washington for an interview, and it was on, the interview was on a Saturday. So 
I checked into a hotel downtown, uh, and they said that I was to, I should go to a particular corner at a particular time in the morning and wait for a Chrysler 300 to pull up and <laughs> flash its headlights a couple of times. And then I was to get in this car, so I felt like a, like a spy. But they wanted to make sure that the media didn't get any any word about people who were being interviewed. So then we, we went to the White House, and as I said, it was a Saturday morning, and they, they brought me up to the president's living quarters. Um, and nobody, first, when I, when I walked into the room, uh, a friend of one of uh, the president's daughters was there, <laughs> <laughs> and then he left, and then... Uh, so there's no, like, pre-brief, you don't beat first for two hours no, with no, all the staff no. to tell you what it's well, going to be like. Well, there had been interviews did, before, but no, not on this particular occasion. <laughs> And so then the, the friend left, and a little uh, uh, Scotty came running in. <laughs> and then the next thing I knew, the president came in uh, wearing kind of casual Saturday clothes. So that was, um, I was wearing a suit, so that was the, my interview with him. Did he ask anything striking, or just uh, do you think he had his, it was his mind already made up? I mean, I wonder how... What your president um, could learn in such an interview, you know. I, I don't, as far as I know, his mind wasn't uh, his yeah. mind wasn't made up. It was a very pleasant interview. Uh, we talked about the same sort of things about the approach to uh, approach to judging, and then we finished up by talking about baseball. I was about to say he's a baseball owner. Yeah. You're a great Phillies fan. Yeah, we we spoke a little bit about baseball. We went over to see the uh, the TV where he watched baseball games. That's good. That's good. So now going backwards, I mean, you, you uh, had long been interested, I think, in the judiciary as a possible career. How did that, how did that happen? Right, that just people would be curious, I think. Uh, obviously, you went to law school, but even before that, I think you had thought a little bit about the law and judging. Yeah, I had. Um, I think maybe I first really became interested in the Constitution when I was in high school, and I was a debater. I did a lot of debating, which is kind of... A, you know, draws a lot of people into becoming lawyers. But anyway, one <laughs> year, the uh, the national there's a, there was in those days. I think there may still be one national debate topic that everybody debated for the course of the whole year. And one year, it was about the exclusionary rule or some constitutional criminal procedure issue. I think it was. I think it was about the exclusionary rule. And so it really, I, I, it made me start to think about the Constitution and what it meant. You look in the Constitution, there's nothing in the Constitution about the exclusionary rule. The Fourth Amendment says uh, no unreasonable searches or seizures, but that, that's it. So where did this come from? Uh, is it legitimate? If it is legitimate, what legitimizes something that is not in the Constitution? So I really began thinking about it at that time. And then when I went to law school, I'm, I'm sorry, when I went to college, I took some political science courses about the Constitution, really some excellent courses. And that's, that's sort of what got me started. And that was at Princeton? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder who was teaching. Was someone particular teaching kind of law? Uh, well, it was in um, kind of a transitional period. The, the professor, I, I had two. Um, uh, 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 Charles Miller taught the main course, but he was there for just a short time. Walter Murphy right, had been I, teaching. I knew there was it, a famous. He uh, was on. He was on leave uh, during the year when I took it, but then he became my senior thesis advisor. Um, he had become very interested in comparative constitutional law. He had done a lot of work with the Irish Supreme Court, and. Um, I was, I had taken these courses and I was sort of looking for, I must confess, a summer boondoggle in, in Europe and there was a, a scholarship to go to Europe to study something or other, whatever you wanted. You had to propose something. So I had never met him. I went to see him and I said, I, you know, I've, uh, I'd like to, to uh, write my thesis on the Italian Constitutional Court and go to Italy to do some say, research. I'm interested in the summer boondoggle. <laughs> no, he probably knew. He, probably, he was probably used to dealing with students that way. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that, that came about. So I Is that right? That. So you yeah. went to Italy and wrote on? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. But your family didn't, your father wasn't, it wasn't a lawyer or there were lawyers? No, no, no there were no lawyers, in, no lawyers in the family. Um, both my parents originally were teachers 
And then um, my mother stayed a teacher for her whole life. I think she, she only left when the police came to her classroom when she reached the mandatory retirement age and, you know, physically uh, removed her. But, you know, she loved it. Uh, but my father left teaching just uh, shortly after I was born, and he became kind of the one-man New Jersey equivalent of the Congressional Research Service. So he, it's hard to believe in those days. You know, today, all the state legislatures, I think, have enormous staffs just like Congress. But in those days, the, the New Jersey legislature had uh, prior to my father's starting, they had two staff people, period. Yeah. They didn't have partisan staff, they didn't have nonpartisan <coughs> staff, they had a bill drafter and an accountant. And then they, they added my father as the researcher. So he was their researcher and he did a lot of drafting of legislation and researching projects for, uh, it was a, a nonpartisan position. Uh, so I, I became somewhat interested. That was one of the other things that got me interested in law because he, although he wasn't a lawyer, he was working with legislation. And I read somewhere that he sort of personally had to do the redistricting of the legislative districts uh, after, I guess, the Supreme Court insisted on one man, one vote. Yeah, he so did. He yeah, did. So I, I, I remember uh, lying in bed listening to the, this clanking of a mechanical, it's hard to believe, a mechanical adding machine. She was, he was downstairs and he was drawing maps uh, to try to pr uh, produce districts uh, for the Senate and for the Assembly that were as close as possible to equal in population, just using, you know, using the mechanical adding machine. It's a little different today, I guess. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so then you decided to go to law school, and you went to Yale Law School. Yes. Very prestigious law school. Not Harvard, of course, <laughs> but someone has to go to Yale Law School. That's good. And uh, why, like, why Yale Law School? Uh, well, um, it was it, it's smaller, and I, uh, uh, I I thought that I, that would be that would be better it would be, be uh, better for me to have a, a smaller school. Um, I had some friends from earlier classes who had gone to Harvard, and I went up and visited them and. They were pretty miserable, and <laughs> they were they were living in. You'll you'll know the name of this building. I don't I don't remember it, but there was a dorm, uh, horrible little rooms. Everybody packed together who went to the law school. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't go to the law school. But I remember visiting friends at the law school. Yeah, it wasn't the most lavish uh, living living quarters. So I thought, well, Yale has to be better. It's smaller. Didn't really have didn't have the same grading system as Harvard. Harvard has now thrown in the towel, and they have the uh, Harvard Law School, I think, has now essentially the same grading, non-grading system as Yale. But in those days, it wasn't true. So at, at Yale, our first term courses were credit fail. And then after that, uh, it was honors pass, low pass fail. Um, I don't know what you would have had to do to get either a low pass or, <laughs> or a fail. It was almost impossible. So basically you could go through with doing minimal work and you would have all passes and it would look reasonably respectable. And I've read that you had read uh, some works of uh, the great Yale Law professor Alex Bickle, Alexander Bickle, before you went to Yale Law School. Is that uh, right? I did, yeah. Um, the book that I, the, f the first book of his that I read was called The Supreme Court and the Idea of Progress, which came out while I was in college. And as I said, I had been thinking about this issue of uh, what would make a constitutional decision legitimate if it wasn't based very clearly on the text of the Constitution or something else that was fixed. The orthodoxy at that time uh, was that, um, aside from a few questions that were settled by the text, judges and justices were really not finding the law in any sense. There was not an objective law out there for them to find. Um, the, this was still, they were, the, the, the orthodoxy was still very much under the spell of the, the legal realists who said that what judges are doing is really implementing their own policy preferences, although they dress it up in fancy language. So. Uh, if you start with a premise like that, what would make a decision legitimate? And that was what Bickle had begun to address earlier. But 
So he began uh, as a really as a defender of the Warren Court, uh, which was a very um, untheoretical court. They, I think, they, they reflected the personality of Chief Justice Warren, who was uh, a practical kind of Republican progressive reformer. So he had a very clear idea of what good policy was. And he used the power of the judiciary to implement that policy. But neither he, I think, nor most of the other justices who were with him in the big Warren Court decisions, with the exception of a Frankfurter who became um, a dissenter. But for the most part, they did not seem to worry very much about the theoretical justification for what they were doing. So Bickle began as a, uh, 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 to provide a theoretical justification for what they were doing, at least in the early years of the Warren Court. But by the time the Supreme Court and the idea of progress came out in the late 1960s, Bickle had become more and more doubtful about uh, what the Warren Court was doing, particularly in the later years. And you read his book or books as an undergraduate? I read his, yeah, I read his book. I was very impressed by it. And I was looking forward to taking some courses from him when I went to law school. Uh, but unfortunately, he became ill almost immediately after I, within, within the year when I started at Yale. So I never did take a course from him. My constitutional law course was taught by someone you may, whose name you may remember, most people today would not remember, Charles Reich. I do remember. The Greening name. of America. Right, huge uh, spokesman for the new left. Yeah. Though he hadn't always been right. He had been a much more normal, so to speak, a moderate, liberal yeah, he was, constitutional um, law professor. He was a, yes, exactly. He was a, a very uh, influential kind of um, avant-garde liberal law professor through most of the 1960s. He wrote uh, a law review article called The New Property, which right. was quite influential and was seen as providing the groundwork for a line of Supreme Court cases that began but was terminated largely after the end of the Warren Court, uh, which uh, his thesis was that um, property rights, traditional property rights, are things, benefits that are given to people by the state, by legislation that is uh, enacted by a state or recognized under the common law. And the, the, the modern, a modern equivalent of that uh, was government benefits. So something like uh, Social Security or other government benefits could be seen as a form of new property. Welfare. I think right, that was exactly. The, yeah. um, so there, there were cases about the due process rights to the termination or denial of welfare that were seen as um, coming from his scholarship or, or related to his scholarship. But by the time um, he taught me, he was experiencing, I think, some personal turmoil and uh, was the most bizarre course. Uh, during the first term at Yale Law School, most of the courses were big traditional law school classes, 50 or so students. So, And you would have three of those. Uh, the, the first year courses were, were um, contracts, torts, uh, civil procedure, and constitutional law. So everybody would have a big class for three of those subjects. But for one of them, you would have a small class of maybe 15 students. And that was supposed to teach you the subject, but also um, teach you legal writing. It was a combination of the two. So I had him for constitutional law. And uh, I kept notes of any Supreme Court case or any other case that was even mentioned during the course of the term. And at the end of the term, there was exactly one <laughs> that had been mentioned. Um, Not really a deep dive into the legal reasoning of the, of the court there? Well, he began by saying th that his thesis was there were no livable lives to be lived in the law. That was his phrase. So he went around the room and he would say, why did you come to law school? And in those days, nobody would say, I came to law school because I want to become a partner at a Wall Street firm and make a million dollars. So everyone would say, 
I came to law school because I think it's a way of, um, of, of uh, achieving social reform or helping society or something like that. And then he would engage in a long debate with each student to try to prove that this was not a good reason for going to law school. Basically, he was telling us, you really shouldn't be here. And this went on for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went on to, to other subjects. So that was my, my con law course. The, the professor who taught the big section, that term in constitutional law, was somebody who wasn't that well known at the time, uh, Robert Bork. Oh. Um, and I, I went to, as soon as I saw that I had been assigned to Charlie Reich's class, I, I had read The Greening of America, and I really was not interested in being in this class. I went to the assistant dean, and I said, can't you possibly switch me so I can be, you know, have uh, a regular constitutional law class? Never in the history of Yale Law School has anybody ever <laughs> switched a class. So. They're supposed, they're supposed to be progressives. They're supposed to change. They're not supposed to be bound by history in that way. But I guess they were still. I was consigned to this ex to this experience. It was bizarre. And he told us that um, he could never tell when he would have to go to San Francisco, but he always had a ticket to San Francisco in his desk. And at some point during the term, it was possible that there would be a note on the bulletin board that he had gone to San Francisco and the course would then be over. And I came back to school after Thanksgiving and I looked at the bulletin board and there was a note, I've gone to San Francisco, that's the end of classes. And that was the end of the classes. So the lesson is if you want to become a Supreme Court Justice, take, take a totally <laughs> worthless con law course in your first term at law school, I guess. Um, so I'm self-taught. A lot of people would say this explains a lot. Yeah, that's good, <laughs> right. I'm curious, I hadn't really intended to ask about this, but I mean, what was it like at Yale Law School in terms, I mean, it's funny that you have Bob Bork teaching one section, Charles Reich, another, uh, in terms of diversity of thought, I mean, obviously, I'm sure the faculty and student body were mostly maybe overwhelmingly liberal, but was it tolerant? Did it foster, I mean, did, was it friendly to dissenting views? I mean, how does that compare with law schools today? I'm just curious. It, it wasn't bad. Uh, I think the students were overwhelmingly um, liberal, uh, but there were, there were a few uh, of us conservatives kind of hiding. Clarence Thomas was there at the time. Uh, John Bolton was there. Right. Um, but it wasn't, the, the classes in those days, and this was true in college as, as well as in law school, were not, I think, highly politicized, right. uh, much less so than today. Do you think at law school today even they are? I thought maybe law school had kept up the tradition of, you know, sort of arguing both sides of the case or of the law a little, I think a little that's more true. than maybe no, the undergraduate. I, I think that's definitely true. It's much better. But um, uh, the, yeah, there's still, the, the, there is a kind of a, you know, an orthodoxy that all the students are, I, I think, kind of assume that that's what they're supposed to think. I took, I took one course at law school when I was in grad school because constitutional law was one of my sort of minor fields for the exams, and it was John Hart Eli. Is that how his name is pronounced? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was a very distinguished. Yes, uh, yes. I didn't realize at the time I was taking the course, was, what did I know, that he was so distinguished. Or I guess maybe he was about to become so distinguished. Yeah. Uh, law professor. Very good course. And uh, he vol this was, I think, 75, maybe. And he volunteered in this course, something I think he had either written at the time or wrote so soon after, that Roe v. Wade had no basis in right. the Constitution or some formulation right. that became yep. fairly well known. Yep. For, and he was a liberal and I think pro-abortion yep. rights yep. as far as it went as a legislative matter. And I do remember at that point in the class, the only time I really remember thinking this, that there was kind of a gasp and a certain amount of, oh my God, how can a professor say this? But I was sort of struck by the willingness to engage in genuine debate. Yeah, I think there's much the more of that in, in law school than um, uh, in, um, in the other subjects because the, the practice of law is adversarial, so people are, and lawyers, is, uh, understand, law students understand that as lawyers, they will be in the position of having to argue a particular point and there will be an argument on the other side and they may have to make the argument on the other side at another point. So there is, because I think of the, the adversarial system of law, there is more of a, a preservation of the idea of actually debating issues than is probably true in, 
in the humanities and the social sciences today. Yeah, well, it's, it's good. Bad for the humanities, but good for, good for law school to some degree. Uh, let me ask you one more just a biographical question. Um, I think most members, you served in, the, uh, in Washington in, in the Justice Department in a couple of sort of capacities for, for most of the Reagan administration or almost all? Uh, yeah, years? for most of it. I started in the Solicitor General's office in 1981, and then I went to the Office of Legal Counsel in 1985. And then in 1987, I went back to New Jersey as U.S. Attorney in New Jersey. So I'm Jersey. curious about that because it seems to me that's the less. Co I, mean, I think most of your colleagues on the court served in the Justice Department at some time or other, I suspect. But uh, being a, a prosecutor, which you were for several stretches of yes, your legal yes. career, what was that like? Do you recommend it to young people as a both for the sake of the country, but as a learning experience? How, how did it shape you? I'm, I'm curious I do. About that. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I, I was an assistant U.S. Attorney um, right after. I had a clerkship on the Third Circuit, uh, the court that I eventually joined. After that, I went across the street to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was able to go to court immediately. I argued. I, I mostly did appellate work. I argued, I don't know, a couple dozen cases in the Third Circuit during that time. So there's no. it's very, very hard for young attorneys in private practice to have any experience in court. Uh, and the U.S. Attorney's Office is one of the few places anymore where you can actually go to court, particularly for people who would like to try cases. Uh, really, the only way to, to get a lot of trial experience anymore is either to be a prosecutor at the federal or state level or, or a public defender. Did you enjoy arguing the cases in court as opposed I to did. the research and all the other stuff? That no, I liked, I, liked, uh, I liked all of it. I liked arguing cases. What's that? I've never, as a non-lawyer, well, what is that like? It looks challenging to me to, and intimidating, but what? It is, it is very, uh, it is very challenging. Um, it's a very unusual format, and when non-lawyers or lawyers from other countries see an appellate argument in the United States, they are somewhat shocked by it. We had uh, a group of judges from the European Court of Human Rights come to have a little conference in Washington a couple of years ago, and before the conference they sat in on one of our morning argument sessions. At lunch I was sitting next to one of the justices, and she was being very diplomatic and polite, but basically what she was saying was that she was shocked uh, by the way the argument was conducted. She said the judges are um, interrupting the lawyers, they're interrupting each other, they're saying things that reveal what they're thinking about the case because the, the standard practice on the continent of Europe, I think, is for the judges, uh, for appellate judges to sit there and listen and that's it. They, in some courts, I think they never ask questions. Now they may ask a few questions, but it's nothing like um, argument here. So if you're arguing, yeah, of course it varies from court to court, but y you have to do two things. You have to keep in mind what you want to say, so you have to have in mind the basic points you want to get across. You can't show up thinking that you're going to deliver a memorized, beautiful speech because that will not happen and you'll be lost as soon as you get interrupted. So maybe you'll come in with the idea that you have three points that you want to make. and. You have to, you know, on some courts, uh, you may have a period of time when there aren't any questions. And so you need to be prepared to make the points that you want to make. But then, really the most important part of the argument is answering the questions that are asked by the bench, because those are presumably things that the judges or the justices are really interested in. When you're talking and they're not saying anything, you really don't know whether they're interested in what you're saying, but if they ask you a question, presumably they're interested in that, in that subject. So you need to be prepared to, to answer that question and then work your way back into the major points that you want to make. So if you come in and you think, I want to make points A, B, and C, and you may be hit two minutes into the argument with a series of questions about point C, you need to answer that and then work your way back. And if you're, the, the really good advocates will read the court. They may get a sense uh, of an argument that isn't going to work. 
they, they have an idea exactly where they want to go, and they may have a preferred route to get to the end point that they desire, but they may see that there's sort of a, there's an accident here or there's, there's a traffic jam here, so there's another route maybe that you can get to, to where you want to go, or maybe you're not going to get all the way to the, the destination that you really want, but you can get to something that's, be that's better than alternatives. And do the argument, well, so on the Third Circuit, I mean, we've all, by now, I think you can listen to the Supreme Court arguments, we all have a sense, if you care about it, one has a sense of how that works, but at the appellate, at the circuit level, there are three, typical case would be a three-judge panel, yes, I suppose. Yes, yes, And how long are these oral arguments, Is uh, like the Supreme Court, they, or more time? They're much more informal, and I think most of the courts of appeals are that way. Uh, we, our standard length was 15 minutes, but as opposed to, to 15 minutes aside, as opposed to 30 on the Supreme Court. But it wasn't rigid at all. So it could go over so, if you had more questions. Yeah, when I was presiding, which I was generally toward the end of my time on the Third Circuit, when we came to the end of the 15 minutes, I would always say, do you have any more questions? Do you have any more questions? And we could go on uh, as long as necessary. I had a colleague on the Third Circuit who just loved oral argument. Um, wonderful judge named Eddie Becker. And when the red light would go on, the lawyers would get ready to sit down and he would say, oh, ignore the red light, you're on our time now. Hmm. And he could go on for another hour or two hours if there were questions that he wanted asked. So it was very informal. Uh, there's not a big audience of observers. At the start of the typical argument morning in the Third Circuit, the courtroom might be fairly full of people, but by the last case, there were generally two people there, you know, <laughs> so everybody there was a lawyer or maybe occasionally a client with a lawyer uh, involved in one of the two cases, but there was not an audience of uh, people who were just there because they were interested. And either at the appellate level or the Supreme Court level, did the oral arguments make much difference? They, they can make a difference. Um, they probably I mean, you've gotten these massive briefs that are thoroughly researched and yeah, presumably yeah. reflect the work of ton, dozens of lawyers and yeah. prestigious law firms and so you sort of wonder from the outside one wonders how you know could being adept in a half an hour argument could that really change a justice's mind or a judge's mind compared to the to the written material well that's exactly right uh, we do a lot of reading and a lot of thinking about the cases before we we take the bench so necessarily I think most of the time we have a pretty strong idea about how the case should be decided, but sometimes things will be said during the argument that will cause um, you to rethink your position. It's more unlikely that it, you will go from thinking the case should be affirmed to reverse to making some other sort of lesser modification in, in the position that you were contemplating. The oral argument on the Supreme Court is usually the first time when any of us gets much of an idea about what the other justices are thinking. So you can tell from their questions what they're thinking, and you may want to modify your position in light of what some of your colleagues um, have said. Yes. On the Court of Appeals, the argument probably changes the outcome, uh, causes a dramatic change in the outcome more frequently as a result of bad lawyering. On the Supreme Court, the average level is very high. Uh, on the Courts of Appeals, it's, it varies a lot. The, the best is as good as we get on the Supreme Court, but the worst is sometimes really bad. So, you know, I, I remember an argument where a lawyer showed up and said, well, I have to inform you that my client has died. That kind of makes a difference, <laughs> uh, but he hadn't brought that to our attention, or my client is in bankruptcy. And so if, it, if, if a party who is sued is in bankruptcy, then all the litigation has to stop. Or the lawyer will tell you something that makes you realize that you really don't have jurisdiction over the case. Doesn't happen at the Supreme Court it, level. Yeah, doesn't. I'm struck that you say that when you hear the oral arguments, it's sometimes the first indication you have of your colleagues' views of, uh, on the case in, in question. I mean, talk about that. So how does it work? Uh, how much do you... Talk to your colleagues informally, formally. How do you, how do you all, how, do, how does the, how does it work as an institution? In the typical case, I will not 
talk to any of my colleagues about the case before we hear the argument. There's no rule against doing it, but it's just generally not done as a matter of tradition or practice or efficiency. Uh, but usually, I will prepare for the argument. I'll read the briefs and everything else that's relevant, and I'll talk about the case sometimes pretty extensively with my law clerks, and then we'll go into the oral argument, and I'll get a sense of uh, where my colleagues are on the case. My, the, on the Supreme Court, the law clerks are very free to talk to each other, so my law clerks usually have a sense of what the, the law clerks in the other chambers are thinking about the case, but that's not necessarily the same thing as what the justices are thinking about the case. So a higher percentage of, your, of one's time on the Supreme Court is spent studying, reading, asking your law clerks to research some further things? Or oh, doing exactly. It I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Usually when there are editorials or articles or speeches in Congress about televising Supreme Court arguments, what is said is that the people have a right to see the court at work. And really, if the people, if, if the public saw us at work, what they would see for the most part, is uh, a justice sitting at a desk or in a chair re reading a brief or typing on a word processor. That's most of the work. The, the oral argument is really a small part of it. But in terms of the decisions, you do vote. So how does that work? So there's the oral argument on right. Tuesday or something like that. OK. Well, let's, if, let's say the argument is on Tuesday, um, then um, after the argument, I will talk to my law clerks and we'll, we'll go through the things that were said during the argument, uh, think about any adjustments in what we had discussed earlier that might be appropriate in light of what was said either by the lawyers or comments that were made by the other justices. Then on Friday we will have our weekly conference and we'll talk about and vote on the cases that we heard that week. The procedure at the conference is pretty formal. The Chief Justice will start and he'll say, okay, the first case is Jones versus Smith. It's, this is what it's about and this is what I think we should do. I think we should affirm. I think we should reverse. The Chief will he actually will. usually volunteer his opinion yes, first? Yes, yes. Huh. Uh, we go in descending order of seniority. He won't speak for a long time, usually. You know, three minutes might but be. But he's senior, even though he's not he's, been there the longest. Uh, yeah, right. and, and he, he is considered to have the greatest seniority. And then the next most, the most senior associate justice, Justice Scalia, would speak, and then Justice Kennedy, and we'll go all around the table doing the same thing. We have a rule that nobody can speak a second time until everybody has spoken once. So we make the complete circuit. And sit in a certain order, kind of the same we seats. We have assigned seats. So it's yes. very, it is kind of formal. Yeah. Everything. Well, I guess as it should be, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Everything based on seniority. Um, seats are based on seniority. And so once you've, we've gone around like that. And that's just the nine of you. There's no clerks just sitting Just the in nine there. of us. No, um, no clerks. Uh, no so we have to take, we all take notes. And it's pretty important to take good notes particularly if you're going to be assigned the opinion because you need to try to remember exactly what at least four of your colleagues think about the case. If you draft a, an opinion and you circulate it, you want at least four uh, justices to agree with you or else it's not going to be the opinion of the court. So it's, it's important to have either have a good memory of what was said or, or take good notes. But in any event, we go around the table and once uh, we've made the complete circuit. Usually, we'll know how the case is going to be decided and the basic rationale of the case. Sometimes, after we've gone around, well, the worst case in terms of uh, efficiency is where there isn't a majority for any judgment. There might be three votes to affirm, three votes to vacate, three votes to reverse. So then, we have to try to see if there is some position, there's some judgment that at least five could agree on. And th that's pretty infrequent. That happens pretty infrequently. But more frequently, uh, once, you, once you've gone around, it's not clear that there is a, a rationale that five will agree on. Um, there may be, let's say, six want to affirm, but 
three want to do it on one ground, three want to do it on another ground. So again, you have to try to find sort of the, the least common denominator, something that five would, would agree on. And then sometimes, if, particularly if it's a more controversial case, uh, someone may want to answer something that was said by someone who spoke later. So there may be a little bit of, of back and forth debate, but it's not an open-ended discussion and it doesn't go on for a very extended period Not of an time. hour of back and forth with no, you and some other justice no. about arguing about it. No, for better or for worse, that's, that's how it's done. It, it changes. It's changed over time. My understanding is that when, uh, when William Rehnquist was the Chief Justice, even less was said. It was, he was a very efficient person, apparently, I, from all accounts. I, I didn't serve when he was chief, but apparently uh, there was not very much discussion as they went around the table. And at times in the past, I think there was an extended discussion. There in the, I, I read a book that said that when Felix Frankfurter was on the court, he would, when, when it came his time to speak, he would get up <laughs> and he would take books down from the, the shelf and he would start reading passages and he would go on and, as he had been a former professor at Harvard Law School. <laughs> William O. Douglas, who was on the court at the time, who had been a professor at Yale Law School, did not like Frankfurt. They just clashed, even though they were both FDR appointees. And, and Douglas said sometimes he would, he would threaten to leave the room because he didn't want to listen to this. And Douglas said that Frankfurter always speaks for 50 minutes because that was the length of the time of a class at the, the law school. So that's what he's used to. So it's changed, but somewhere in kind of a intermediate position right now. So you cast these votes and they're not binding. You could change your mind as right. you continue to research and think and right. read opinions. But based on these votes, the Chief Justice assigns the opinions. Is that how it works? Yes. The Chief, the senior justice in the majority will assign the opinion. So if the Chief is in the majority, he will assign the opinions. And he will do that uh, or the opinions will be assigned at the end of each two-week argument session. So that doesn't happen right away on Friday. No. That's later, yeah. Uh, not unless that's the, the Friday at the end of the two-week session. So at the end of two weeks, usually we will have heard 12 cases. And Friday afternoon, an opinion assignment list will come around. So of the 12, we will uh, almost always, we will each get at least one, and then three justices will get two. So at the end of the year, basically, we've all received about the same number of opinion assignments. Right, we court watchers, or I'm not really one, but right. the court watchers who right. I read are all always reading the entry right. to see does exactly. Alito yeah. still have two opinions, you know, right. likely yeah. outstanding or whatever, right? right? But so the majority opinion is assigned by either the chief right. or by the uh, ranking, the most senior right. person likely to be in the majority. And on the dissenting side, is there any assignment, or do people just decide to, to dissent? <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is, this yes, both things are true. Uh, the <laughs> let's say it's five to four. Then the senior justice in the minority may uh, assign a dissent for the majority, or ask if so. The senior justice might ask me, "Would you like to write the dissent? Would you write the dissent in this case?" And then I would write the dissent. But we always can. Right. We can always write a concurring opinion or a dissenting opinion if we want to. But only the majority opinion is really assigned in that sort of yes, formal way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I see. That's interesting. Interesting. Um, and then you, people get to work writing. Yeah. So then, uh, if it's assigned to me, um, I will begin writing uh, and working with my law clerk, and uh, I'll do a lot of work on this before I circulate it uh, to the court. Once I've drafted something, again, keeping in, in mind both what I would like to say and what I think I can get a majority for. Uh, and sometimes you need to think about whether you want to aim just for five or do you want to write something that will get six or seven or eight or nine. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility there. But once I've drafted something that I'm satisfied with, then I will circulate it. This is what everyone does. We'll circulate it to all the justices. And what I hope Including for... Including those who have yes. said they would be in the, likely be in the minority. Yes, exactly. All the communications about cases, uh, almost all of them are done in writing. And 
everything is circulated to the full conference, to all the justices, no matter which side they're on. It's not a 100% rule, but that's the general rule. And I, what I hope is that I will very quickly receive eight memos saying, this is perfect, you know, don't change a word. <laughs> right. And it doesn't always work out that way. And do they let you know, I mean, necessarily, if they're going to still uh, concur in the judgment, that, but I'm going to write a concurring opinion that, in which I explain that I don't agree with part three of your opinion? Or Yes, so yes. So that, that's all explained. I mean, that's all. Uh, usually. Um, what I will receive is um, a memo uh, indicating whether that justice is going to join the opinion. I and, and I may get uh, a memo that says, I will join if you make this change and this change and this change, or um, I will. I join your opinion, but I suggest that you make certain changes. So that would be leaving it to the discretion of the author. Or I may get a memo saying, um, in accordance with my vote at conference, I'm going to dissent. Um, on the Friday conference, one of the things we do is to do an inventory of the cases where the opinions are circulating. So if I had circulated an opinion, we'll, we'll go through the list. And um, sometimes at that point, someone will say, I'm waiting. I was in the majority of conference but I, uh, on the vote, but I'm going to wait and see what the dissent says. Um, so sometimes that will happen. And occasionally, a decision will flip, you know, maybe once a term or so something that was it was five to four one way ends up being five to four the other way someone who was in the majority reconsiders after reading the dissent thinking about the case and so it's not the most efficient thing but it can happen and the votes aren't final so to speak until the actual opinion no is the uh, yeah no the the votes are not final until we go out on the bench to announce is the decision right? so in theory on a, let's say, on a Monday morning when a certain case is ready to be announced, someone in the majority could, could say, something came to me over the weekend and I realized my position is wrong and I'm switching my position and that's going to switch the decision. It, it, can't, I don't, it hasn't happened <laughs> right. that way during my time, but it could. But it could happen the week before and people could yeah. be writing to exactly. the last minute. Exactly, yeah. It's an interesting combination, I suppose, thinking about it just, I really hadn't thought about it this way before, stepping back of sort of you know, on the one hand, reasoning. I mean, these are supposed to be reasoned opinions, and so that's why all the work and all the, uh, you know, the, the legal, the legal reasoning and the research. But it is also, in a sense, a democratic procedure. Getting a majority of nine. Yeah, so I right. suppose it's an interesting way to, when you think about it, it's a, it's a process that mixes both, you know, pure reasoning, you might say, uh, legal reasoning, and yeah. a certain amount of democracy yeah. and. Yeah. Justice Brennan is supposed to have said to his law clerks when they began, what's the most important thing for a Supreme Court justice to know? And um, maybe they didn't, you know, there would be a pause and he would say, this is the most important thing for a Supreme Court justice to know, five. You need to, have, you need to get to five to do anything. And to get to five or six or seven if you want to get more, I assume people don't they're not going to make an argument they don't think is a correct argument. I suppose it's more a matter of not pushing as far as you might want to push in s terms of overturning something or, or elaborating on a, the implications of a certain yes, argument. Yeah. Is that right? I mean, it's... Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, it's different from what I imagine takes place and considered to be proper in a legislative body where you could, uh, someone could vote for something that that person doesn't really believe in in exchange for getting a vote on something else. I don't know that that's considered to be unethical behavior no, if by, the thing is more important, I by mean, a legislator. Right. But uh, on, on a court, you can't, you know, you, that, that's improper. And, and I don't know of any instance of where, where it's been done. So you can't really, you can't trade your vote. Uh, and I don't think any of us would actually sign on to something that we don't believe in. But uh, we are often required to sign on to something that is not exactly what we would prefer. And it's a, it becomes a hard, uh, one of the hardest things for an appellate judge. It was hard when I started and it's still hard sometimes is to figure out how far you should bend before you say, I can't go 
any further. Um, so if, you, if someone circulates a majority opinion and it's, it's not what you would have written and you really don't like certain aspects of it, maybe you don't like the language, how far can you go uh, for the purpose of making a majority or for the purpose of just not writing another meaningless separate opinion? How far can you go before you have to say, you know, I can't, I can't go any further? But I suppose on the other side, it's a matter of sort of comedy. It's not good form to sort of just write separate or concurring or what is that, partially, you know, agreeing in the judgment but dissenting, you know, d disagreeing with certain aspects, to do that in some sort of pedantic way where, you know, I don't like the following two paragraphs in this section and the following yeah. part of this section. And this, and that's important, I suppose, right? It's, yeah. not like, it's not like, it's you know, law school or something where you can, no. a professor can say, well, I would agree, I agree with arguments, you know, one, three, four, six, eight, and part of nine, and I'm going to explain now why the others are wrong. I don't think the... The court doesn't want no, it's each a, justice it's, to be that. No, exactly. It's a hard line. Um, as a former consumer of Supreme Court opinions, when I was on the Court of Appeals, what I wanted, and I think what all the lower court judges want, what all the what parties want, what lawyers want, is a pretty clear rule. So it's nice to have a majority opinion. It's difficult when you have to put together uh, opinions and try to figure out what the holding is. But on the other hand, sometimes I, I might get the draft of a majority opinion, and I agree with the bottom line, or it could be a dissent. I agree with the, with the bottom line and the basic argument, but there may be paragraphs that are based on past decisions from which I've dissented. And so it's kind of hard to, you know, I, I accept the fact that this case was decided and it's binding on me, but I still think I was right in that case, and it's hard to sign on to something that is enthusiastic about a position that I thought was incorrect. So there, there are a lot of very hard lines to draw. Do you, I was saying, I want to ask you about your colleagues, but in terms of you've obviously studied, I'm, you've probably read a huge percentage of the opinions of almost all your predecessors on the court, I would guess. Uh, who do you admire the most? Um, who do you, who do you, I'm just Well, there are a lot that who, I admire. Who should, we, yeah. who should we go back to read if we want to really see what being a Supreme Court justice should be, how it could be done well? There, there are a lot that I, I admire for different things, and there's no one single justice that I would say I want to model myself on. John Marshall, it would be presumptuous right. to do it with, with some, and the issues are different. The, the way the court operates over time has changed. The style of writing opinions has changed a lot. Um, I admired uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist very much. I thought that he was, uh, uh, he achieved a lot he was uh, during his time um, during his time on the court. He started out dissenting on uh, so often by himself on certain issues, um, often about federalism issues. And by the time he became chief justice, he had assembled a majority in favor of some of his of his positions. So I ad I admired him. Um, John, the second justice Harlan was very scholarly. Person, I, I admire his work. Justice Jackson was a very great, uh, was a good writer, a very yes. memorable writer. The last justice who didn't graduate from law school. Right. I guess he still, what is it called? He studied uh, apprentice, sort of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For yeah, the, yeah. For the bar. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, that is interesting. And if someone, probably I'm just thinking about this now, but if some publisher came to you and said, you know, you could edit so selected opinions of one. If your predecessors Gosh. that people should read, I mean, someone as, as, as you say, it's it's hard. Probably don't want to go all the way back because the issues are so different, maybe. But in terms of 20th century, let's say, justices, that's that's hard. It is really hard. Or two or um, three. Well, maybe the ones that I mentioned. I think Harlan, those yeah. would be those would be some that I'd mentioned. The first Justice Harlan is a very interesting figure and uh, an admirable figure in a lot of ways. He was the only dissenter in Plessy Plessy. versus Ferguson. Um, very old-fashioned man in maybe, you know, in some, in some good ways. Um, one of his, he was kind of derided by his more sophisticated colleagues. Uh, Holmes said he was the last of the tobacco-chewing justices, which I think was true. He used to chew tobacco on the bench, believe it or not. <laughs> And uh, Justice Brewer said that uh, 
uh, Harlan goes to sleep each night with one hand on the Constitution and one hand on the Bible, and he sleeps the sweet sleep of the just. And he said that as a, as a you know, like a kind of a, crit a critical comment, but maybe that's not such a bad thing. I mean, I remember this from years ago. I haven't looked at this stuff, unfortunately, a long time. But uh, when I taught a couple of political science courses on common law, the dissent in Plessy is really a powerful and yep. moving, I would say, document. He was, um, and he came from a, a slave owning family, right. Uh, right. from a southern background. The majority opinion in the case was written by Henry Brown, who was not very well remembered, but. I believe that he has the distinction of being the only Supreme Court justice who attended both Harvard and Yale law schools. Yeah. And he was so. the opinion upholding, <laughs> upholding so maybe that Jim says Crow. Something, that yeah. does say a lot, I think. <laughs> um, there's so many things that one could ask about your, in terms of your work on the court, and uh, so, so much of it's so interesting. Uh, but let me ask about the. Um, rather unusually, I think, in I think the 2010 term, 2011. You dissented in two free speech cases. Adam White wrote about it for the Weekly Standard, and I think people noticed it because there's always been a sort of simple-minded, you know, political divisions on the court, and that's true some of the time. Mm -hmm. The divisions are 6-3 or 5-4, and you sort of can guess some of the time who's going to be with whom, and suddenly you were dissenting in two different, I think, 8-1 to one decisions in which the opinions were written by with Justice Scalia, I think, in one case, and, um, and, and the Chief Justice, and the chief justice one, in, the other, in the other, yes. People with whom you're often um, allied. Yeah. So talk about those two, those two cases and well, what, the what first, your thoughts yeah. on free speech. I think there you have a distinctive, I think, view, a very interesting one, I think, on free speech, political speech, and so forth. The first one was a case called uh, United States versus Stevens, and it was, it involved the constitutionality of a statute that prohibited the creation or circulation of depictions of animal cruelty. It was enacted by Congress to stamp out something called crush videos, which are horrible things. Um, they are videos of a person, uh, presumably a woman wearing high-heeled shoes, stamping a little animal to death, a hamster or sometimes a kitten or something like that. And um, there's apparently, there was, uh, maybe there still is a market for this sort of thing. So all you would see on the video was the foot and the animal being, uh, the animal being crushed to death. Uh, and it's ver virtually impossible to find out who was doing this. The, a the physical activity could be made illegal. No one questions that, that you could have a law against animal cruelty. But can you, ha can you have a law that prohibits the creation of these videos without which the animal cruelty would not take place? That was the theory of it. And the court said no. That this the is a federal, federal statute, federal statute. yes. Um, the statute was overbroad uh, because there were some, you could think of examples of things that would fall within the literal terms of this statute that were quite removed from these crush videos. Uh, the, the Chief Justice wrote the opinion in the case, and he had the example of uh, someone shooting a deer out of season in, uh, in a particular state. That would be an illegal activity. And so if you had a video of this person, a hunter shooting this deer out of season, or cockfighting in Puerto Rico where, where it's legal. In any event, I, I dissented in that But case. that was not the instance. In no, the, this the actual the, case was a real the, the, the video, case really. itself. Well, the, ca the case itself was actually, um, uh, they were videos of dog fights. Yeah. You know, dogs tearing each other apart. Um, so the court held that that was unconstitutional, and I dissented. And then the other one was Snyder versus Phelps, which had to do with protests at the funerals of soldiers who were killed, mostly killed in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. There was a group that, uh, a small group that felt very strongly about two things. They were against homosexuality and they were against the Catholic Church. And so they, and somehow made the connection between homosexuality and the U.S. military. Uh, and so they would look in the papers, presumably, for the funeral of a soldier and they would show up 
and they would protest outside of the, the, the church or wherever the funeral was being held. And they would, in this particular case, the, the soldier um, was being buried in Maryland and they showed up in this small town in Maryland and they had placards that said horrible things about him personally and uh, it was very distressing to the family members who were in attendance. So they were sued under a very well-established tort that goes back t to the 19th century, the intentional infliction of emotional, of severe emotional distress. And I thought that this tort constituted a reasonable exception to the First Amendment, but uh, my colleagues disagreed about that. So explain the, I mean, your, your and, and you wrote powerful dissents in those two, in my opinion, in those two cases. Um, what about the obvious sort of simple argument? Well, look, you, it's a slippery slope. You can't curtail speech. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the argument the majority made one way or the other, I would say. Well, I think some members of the majority, this is not based on inside information. This is what I, uh, I get from reading the opinion. I, I, I think that there are those who would support the majority decision in both those cases for exactly that reason. So if we, we, uh, if we say even in these outrageous situations, we will, we are, we will not tolerate any abridgment of freedom of speech, then when something comes along that I would regard and I think our cases would regard as really being at the core of the free speech protection, um, that th these decisions provide a guarantee or they provide a wall of protection against a bad decision in those areas. If I really believed that to be the case, I might think that it was a, uh, a, uh, an appropriate trade-off. I don't think that's the case. I think that, um, that, that judges who are uh, inclined to make a bad decision, an anti-free speech decision in a case involving core political speech, will find a way of getting around these little, the, these these uh, these little cases. So what I think has been going on in in those two cases, and another one um, where I was in dissent, this time not by myself, in the United States versus Alvarez, yeah, talk about that, yeah. which had to do with the. Uh, constitutionality of a statute passed by Congress called the Stolen Valor Act. Uh, what I think has been going, when the Stolen Valor Act prohibited um, a false claim of having received a military medal. So this... Which was happening a lot at the time. It was happening a lot. Right. People were making up, uh, uh, you know, claiming to have won the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's what this what Mr. Alvarez did. He said, well, I won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Well, he hadn't done no such thing. Um, and the court struck down that statute, uh, six to three. But I think what um, th th those cases um, involve um, a diversion, I think, of attention from the core, prote from what is most important about the guarantee of freedom of speech. The, I think freedom of speech protects, uh, serves many purposes. But I believe, and I think the court has said that at the core, uh, whatever other purposes it may serve, it, it is vitally important for democratic self-government. If people cannot debate public issues, if they cannot debate the relative merits of political candidates, then democracy is basically impossible. So I think that is the core of the protection. These cases involving depictions of animal videos, uh, uh, video, uh, depictions of animal cruelty, um, um, uh, the protests at military funerals claim, falsely claiming to have won the Congressional Medal of Honor don't involve anything like that. Uh, and uh, if we lose focus uh, on what is at the core of the free speech protection by uh, concentrating on these peripheral issues, I think there's a real danger that uh, our free speech cases will go off in a bad direction. On, in the cases that we've had that I think involve core free speech, uh, the example that I, the, the chief example I would give from my time on the court is the Citizens United case. Um, the court has, now that came out five to four protecting the right to freedom of speech, but it was five to four. And 
it has it remains very controversial. My former colleague uh, John Paul Stevens has written a book recommending a number of constitutional amendments to correct the decisions he really disagreed with on the, during his time on the court, and that's one of them. He wants an amendment to the First Amendment, which is pretty remarkable, to overrule the decision in Citizens United. Well, Citizens United, I think, is core political speech. It is a video about a candidate for the presidency of the United States. If that's not protected by First Amendment free speech, by the First Amendment free speech guarantee, I don't know what I don't know what is. So on these, on things that are at the core, the court has been shakier than it has been on these things that are at the periphery. So the argument that protecting the periphery helps protect the core doesn't seem to. I don't think hold it. No, I don't think. I don't think it works. And you also make the argument, as I recall, in at least one or two of those three dissents, you make more, in a sense, a positive argument also for the virtues of for the right and ability of a community to draw certain boundaries around a kind of civility or civilized behavior almost in the case of the soldiers' funerals or, well, all of them really, the animal cruelty, all three of them lying, uh, you know, those are all things that you would, a community would have a reasonable interest in discouraging, to say the least. I, I think that's true, um, and I think that's appropriate in cases that don't involve uh, political speech. Um, I would not make the same argument in a case involving, uh, in the case involving political speech. I thought all of them were cabined uh, by specific rules, the very reasonable rules. So in the animal cruelty case, I thought that was very similar to the rationale. I thought the rationale there should be very similar to the rationale against child pornography, which is that you can't produce child pornography without abusing a child, and by stamping out child pornography or trying to stamp out child pornography, you are attacking the, uh, the underlying abuse. Same thing with these crush videos. You couldn't stamp them out without, getting with, without preventing the creation of the, and the circulation of the, of the, of the videos. Um, but I wouldn't make that kind of an argument. I think that kind of an argument is a dangerous argument when you're talking about political speech. Um, and in, in, if you compare our law, for example, to the law in the democratic countries that believe in human rights in Europe, they go much further. They, they, they are much more restrictive of, of, of speech, including, including political speech. There are laws against hate speech. There are laws on defamation of a public figure. Uh, make it much easier for people to sue, uh, for a public figure to sue someone who uh, the public figure thinks, the public official thinks, has, has said something false. Yeah, we had an article about this in the Weekly Senator. The, the laws against hate speech seem, if you just step back and look at the actual speech that's going on in these countries that have had these laws, not to have been very effective, and if anything, perhaps to have had a slightly you know, uh, contrarian effect of, I don't know, somehow, romant you know, romanticizing this, the daring, you know, anti-Semitic speech or whatever. I they're think that's to probably true. Prevent. But certainly, they, they, have, they have laws against, against hate speech, including uh, Holocaust denial speech. Right. And yet, you see what's happening with anti-Semitism in Europe. So it doesn't seem to be very effective. Uh, we're speaking shortly after the end of the 2014-15 term, and it closed with the dramatic uh, Oberkerfell case on, on uh, same-sex marriage and marriage equality, and uh, uh, you dissented along with three other justices. I think you each wrote your own dissents, mm -hmm. and yours is a powerful dissent, which I recommend to everyone to read in full, but it does close with a st uh, strong, I could say, Bickelian. It reminded me of Alexander Bickel, he wrote the least, least dangerous branch, a concern that you express about almost the legitimacy of the court in light of this decision. You say this is... Uh, People are sincere and, and, and wishing, in, in, in the vision of liberty, you're, you're, the majority was sincere in the vision of liberty it held or, and it expressed in this case, but this sincerity is cause for concern, not comfort. What it evidences is the deep and perhaps irremediable co corruption of our legal culture's conception of constitutional interpretation. That's a strong statement, and uh, you obviously thought a lot before writing it, and I'm going to just explain, how, uh, explain the corruption and explain what we citizens should think about that. 
Well, the decision was based on really one word in uh, the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment prohibits the deprivation of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So this was all based on liberty and on a substantive protection of liberty, not a procedural protection, which is what you might think the Due Process Clause was about, but substantively the Constitution protects certain liberties, the court held, and the right to same-sex marriage is one of those liberties. The idea of substantive due process has been very controversial throughout the court's history. It was a prominent feature in a number of pre-New Deal Supreme Court decisions where it was used to protect property rights. And the New Deal constitutional revolution E tried to either kill off substantive due process completely or to relegate it to a very, very minor role. But it has experienced a revival in more recent years, not in the area of property rights, but in the area of some non-property individual rights, including, um, including same-sex marriage. So the jurisprudential question is what limits the definition of how do we determine what liberty in the 14th Amendment means. Liberty means different things to different people. That for our libertarians, for classical liberals, it does include the protection of, of economic rights and property rights. For uh, progressive social democrats, it includes the protection of uh, a, a right. Liberty means the you know, freedom from want, et cetera, et cetera, f uh, government benefits. Um, and there are many other conceptions. The court's conception, I said in this opinion, and I believe to be true, is sort of a, is a very postmodern idea. It's the, it's the freedom to define the, your understanding of, of the meaning of life. Uh, your, uh, it, it's the right to, to self-expression. So if all of this is on the table, how, oh, how, where are the, the legal limits on it? If a, if a libertarian is appointed to the Supreme Court, is it then proper for the libertarian to say, well, um, I, I think that there is a right to uh, work for less than the minimum wage. I think there's a right to work as many hours as, as I want without being limited by, by the government. Um, I think uh, I have the right to build whatever I want on my property, irrespective of zoning laws and so forth. If a, if a, uh, a socialist is appointed to the Supreme Court, can the socialists say, I think that the liberty in the 14th Amendment means that um, everyone uh, should have a guaranteed annual income or that uh, all education through college should be absolutely free or whatever. There's no limit. The court had tried to limit this uh, in some earlier cases from the, the Rehnquist era, prominently a case called Glucksburg, which involved the, the claim that there's a constitutional right to die, uh, by saying that this liberty protects those rights that are deeply rooted in the traditions of the country. Uh, so it ha you had to find a strong historical pedigree for this right. But the Obergefell decision um, threw that out, it did not claim that there was a strong tradition of uh, protecting the right to same-sex marriage. This would have been impossible to find. So we are at, uh, we are at sea, uh, I think. I don't know what the limits of, of um, substantive liberty protection under the 14th Amendment are at this point. And I suppose that does get to the question of the court's credibility and authority. I mean, if, if well, they're just at sea, you know, who gave them the right to yeah, steer the ship, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. It, um, you know, what is, uh, where do we get the authority to impose what we think about same-sex marriage or what we think about uh, minimum wage laws or what we think about uh, free college tuition or anything else on the rest of the country. If it's not in the text of the Constitution or if it's not in something 
that is objectively, uh, objectively ascertainable. If it's just whatever I, as, a, a, as an appointee to the Supreme Court, happen to think is very important. So I don't know where it, it, it raises questions of legitimacy. It raises practical questions of, because the more the court does this sort of thing, the more the process of nomination and confirmation will become like a, an election, it will become like a political process. And I suppose it also doesn't give any guidance to lower court judges about wh where they should draw the no, line. So no, you'll have exactly. a, other people presumably deciding you have a right to use heroin or something. If it, I mean, why? I, I think that's right. So this will be an ongoing debate about the court? And the, and well, it has been. Th this issue has been a, a, a hotly debated issue for a long time, but this is going to, um, this, this will fuel uh, that fire. Well, maybe it'll be a healthy fire if it leads to a real civic debate and uh, not simply a political or partisan fire. Uh, I can't close without asking you about baseball. Uh, <laughs> someone who visited you in chambers uh, said that there are almost as many baseball uh, uniforms, baseballs, paraphernalia, historical stuff on your walls as there are law books. That's probably an exaggeration, but I guess you've always, you've, you're a big baseball fan? I, I am. I have a, a you know, collection of baseball, baseball memorabilia, which my wife has encouraged me to remove from the house and take to my chambers. So I have a little uh, one section. I have more books than baseball I stuff, know, but, I, I, I'm <laughs> just kidding. but I have a, a little section of uh, my bookshelf that's full of pictures and things like that that I've collected over the years. And you're a Phillies fan? I am, yes. I tough think year for? Very, very tough year. Uh, very tough year. Any memorable moments in your baseball Playing or you, did you play baseball as a kid? Too, I, I did not. Uh, not recruited for the majors. No, not, not no. offered a contract. Two, two things happened at a certain point in my baseball career. One, um, I needed glasses, and in those days, right. it was really considered not to be too athletic to wear glasses. So that made it hard to hit, and I, I, I overcame that. But the other, I couldn't overcome, and that was when the pitchers started to throw pitches that moved yeah you know the difference between the fastball and the curve that was that that uh, eliminates a lot so but anyway I was not a, a great baseball player I played until my teenage years but I've been a I've been a very devoted fan I think that if you're a real fan you must stick with your team it's like uh, treason to leave even when times are not good and uh, they, they are not they, they certainly are not too good right now I grew up, uh, as we were, we were talking earlier, I grew up in near Trenton, New Jersey, which is at the midpoint of the New York and Philadelphia zones of sports influence. And when I was forming my baseball uh, affiliation uh, in the 1950s, the Yankees won every year, almost every year. And most of my friends, many of my friends were Yankees fans. They were very smug. Uh, and the Phillies were declining, and so for some reason I, I can't remember, I chose the team that was losing instead of the team that was always winning. I think it's had a big influence on my, on my personality. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing as a kid. I was an anti-Yankee fan when most of my friends in Manhattan in New York were Yankee fans, and those were still the great days of uh, Mantle. And, and uh, Maris and all that, but uh, I voted for the Tigers sort of randomly since I had no connection to Detroit except that I, they were sort of challenging the Yankees. So it wasn't quite going to root for the worst team. It was rooting for a team that might have a chance to upset the, though they almost never did, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the prohibitive favorite. Well, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that you were rooting for the underdog. Any one particularly memorable game you were at or a moment on a, on a baseball at a, at a stadium? Most people, uh, most people who are fans have one or two special. No, yeah. Um, I really recall uh, going to the first the first time I went to a night game. My, oh. my family used to go to double headers on Sunday. So for I think the ticket cost a dollar twenty five, and for a dollar twenty five we could see two games. And this was in the old Philadelphia this was in, Stadium. Yeah, I guess I was Connie, never there. Connie yeah, Mack Stadium. Stadium. And in those days, Philadelphia had there was a, an ordinance that prohibited any inning from beginning after I think it was six o'clock on Sunday. God. So, if would now be found unconstitutional, <laughs> undoubtedly, <laughs> undoubtedly. But anyway, for 
you know, for a dollar and a quarter each. And we would bring, in those days, you could bring your own food in, you could bring in a thermos. So we would have a picnic and we would sit in the same seats, kind of a semi-obstructed view along the right field fence to see the doubleheader. But I remember my father took me to a night game and I remember I walked into the stadium and at night it just looks completely different. It's an amazing sight. I remember a player uh, on the Cincinnati Reds named Ted Klazuski who uh, wore short sleeves and had big muscles. And Huge, it, this yeah, was yeah, yeah. in the days before base, baseball players at that time thought it was very bad to lift weights. Uh, it would make you stiff and muscle bound. So there was none of the the weight training that goes on today, but Ted Klazuski stood out because he had these, he was a really muscular guy, and he hit a home run over, there was a big fence in right field, uh, like about a 25 foot, 30 foot fence, no, no stands out there, but just this big fence. He hit a home run that went over this fence and just disappeared into the night, and I, I still remember that. Well, oh, that's a great, a great, a memorable note. I, I wish to close. Justice Alito, thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today, and uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.